Welcome everyone to the Edith Puff Sr. and Edith Kuttmeyer Puff Memorial Lecture uh, in the Study of Christianity, which is uh, sponsored by the Department of Comparative Religion. I am Professor Scott Kenworthy in the Department of Comparative Religion. And this evening's lecture uh, given by Dr. Laura Stivers is Hospitality as Justice, Christian Approaches to Homelessness. And for a few words about the Puff Memorial Lecture, we will hear from uh, Prue Dana, who is a member of the Puff family. On behalf of the Puff family, I want to welcome you all to the uh, Puff Memorial Lecture on uh, Christianity and the approaches to homelessness. Uh, this lecture series came about uh, through the donation of uh, two brothers who were both Miami graduates. Uh, one uh, was a pastor in Dayton and the other uh, taught management uh, here at Miami. And they were both so grateful that their parents had literally cashed in every penny that they had in order to allow them to go to Miami University. And that was seen as just so important in their lives. And so they wanted to give back to the university and uh, it came about in the form of a lecture. Um, I worked at the Presbyterian Church for over 30 years and uh, they talked with me and I referred them to uh, Peter Williams who uh, helped them create uh, a, a lecture series and uh, it's been going on for 35 years and it gets more interesting and more interesting all of the time because uh, it's, it's a very contemporary topic of homelessness and uh, it should be a, a good discussion. So thanks to Prue. So Dr. Laura Stivers is professor of social ethics at Dominican University of California. She has degrees from Graduate Theological Union, Pacific School of Religion, and St. Olaf College. She is the author of Disrupting Homelessness, Alternative Christian Approaches, co-author of two case study books, Earth Ethics, a Case Method Approach, and Christian Ethics, a Case, case Method Approach, and co-editor of Justice in a Global Economy, Strategies for Home, Community, and World. Laura was past president of the Southeast Commission for the Study of Religion and served on the board of the Society of Christian Ethics. In relation to homelessness and housing, Laura has served on the board of the Street Chaplaincy in San Rafael, participated in a rotating shelter through her church, and worked with Stand Up Neighborhood, Neighborly Novato to advocate for affordable housing in her community. So as I announced, the, the title of the lecture is Hospitality as Justice, Christian Approaches to Homelessness. And I will note that we will um, take a break about halfway through to entertain just a couple questions. So if you have questions as we go along, um, please follow the link there and, um, and post them, and then I will read them uh, to uh, Dr. Stivers. So please, Dr. Stivers. Thank you, Dr. Kenworthy, for your invitation to speak about my book, Disrupting Homelessness, Alternative Christian Approaches. And thank you, Prue, for introducing. I also, uh, this is how I got into this work, actually, was um, working with the Presbyterian Church. They were doing their study on homelessness, and I was on the task force. Uh, and everybody on the task force uh, knew a lot about homelessness, worked with the homeless, or worked with affordable housing, and I was the theological ethicist. And so I decided to write a paper and do some research, and that's out of that paper came this book. Um, so the topic of homelessness is very timely uh, today after more than a year of the pandemic. Millions of people are struggling with loss of income, and many fear the loss of their housing. So often we focus on the visibly homeless, that is the chronically homeless on the streets, but they represent only a small part of the picture. Even before last year, about 11 million households, that is one in four U.S. renters, were spending more than half their income on housing. 
uh, and a third of your income is what's considered affordable housing. And more people are sharing overcrowded living spaces simply to get by. For every 100 very low income households today, there are only 36 affordable rentals. Well, my views have not changed substantially since publication of my book in 2010. If I could publish a revised version, I would apply a deeper racial, racial analysis to the problem of hopelessness, identifying the systemic racism in housing, criminal justice, education, employment, and healthcare, as well as the way racism is used to thwart policies and structural changes that would ensure all people can afford housing. I would also emphasize even more strongly the need for more affordable rental housing in our nation. Blacks are overrepresented in the homeless population. They make up 40% of the homeless, but only constitute 13% of our population. The Latinx homeless rate is roughly equal to their percentage of population, around 22%, and whites and Asians are underrepresented in the homeless population. I began my writing of the book during the Great Recession of 2008, 2008, which caused the largest loss of minority wealth in U.S. history, 66% for Latinx families and over 50% for African American families. Today, the pandemic, with both its negative health and economic effects, is disproportionately affecting communities of color due to existing structural inequality and oppression. While housing insecurity, unemployment, and racial inequality affected communities of color long before COVID-19, disparities have been greatly exacerbated by the pandemic. And I think we'll find that the number of people who are unhoused or precariously housed in our nation has and will continue to increase. So talking about my book, in the book, I examine typical approaches that Christian churches and organizations take in response to homelessness in relation to the Christian tradition's emphasis on hospitality as a necessary practice of faith. The main thesis of the book is that a Christian approach of hospitality ought to aim at preventing the structural causes of homelessness and poverty, and not simply focus on responding with direct charity to overwhelming need. This simple claim that we address the root causes of homelessness and advocate for justice over charity seems such basic common sense, yet remains elusive and is often not the approach taken. Too often Christian approaches identify the cause of homelessness as lack of individual responsibility, rather than a failure of the way we've structured our society. A secondary thesis of the book is that many Christian approaches reinforce dominant ideologies of both, about both homelessness and housing in ways that can be both oppressive for those who are poor and are homeless, and can serve to mask the root causes of homelessness, thereby ensuring that the status quo of oppression and inequality remains intact. There are two common approaches um, that I identify to homelessness that religious organizations and frankly secular organizations for that matter take towards homelessness. One is a direct charity approach of providing soup kitchens or homeless shelters and another is a more structural approach of building either low-income rental housing or inexpensive homes for ownership. I focus on two organizations as samples of these two approaches. For the direct charity approach, I look at the Association of Gospel Rescue Missions, sometimes referred to as AGRM, and for the more structural approach, Habitat for Humanity. In a society where people are going hungry and have no place safe to lay their head at night, direct charity responses are urgently needed. It's clear, however, that religious organizations can't respond to the overwhelming need, especially in this time of pandemic and unemployment. Thus, more structural approaches that address the causes of homelessness and precarious housing are also necessary. Building houses for both low-income rental and ownership aims to address one of the key causes of homelessness, lack of affordable housing but private nonprofits can't meet the need. Even Habitat's impressive efforts of helping 35 million people worldwide gain access to new or improved housing is not enough. And this number includes international product projects, thus the number of homes built and are renovated in the US is much lower. While well, both of these organizations do good work and aim to embrace hospitality, I identify ideologies they espouse, often implicitly, but sometimes explicitly, 
that disempower people who are unhoused or precariously housed. I also examine the ways in which these typical approaches do not disrupt unjust systems or policies that cause homelessness. The most empowering thing staff members do at rescue missions is to journey with people in their troubles. Unlike the volunteers at many soup kitchens and shelters run by individual churches or coalitions of churches, a substantial number of staff, although not a majority, at rescue missions were formerly homeless and therefore know what it's like to deal with poverty. What Habitat does best is offer the option of home ownership to people who are stable and responsible, yet unable to afford market rate house payments and interest on a loan. Most Habitat homeowners stay in their houses for a substantial amount of time, leading to equity in their homes and stability in their neighborhoods. Habitat's philosophy of no interest loans, its support of green housing, and its understanding of partnership, where the less well off and the better off both contribute to a beloved society, offer an important alternative vision to the predatory and environmentally unstable and unsustainable nature of capitalism. AGRM and Habitat are simply examples I use to illustrate two approaches that many churches and religious organizations take to address homelessness. And they're not alone in unwittingly espousing ideologies that can serve to disempower people who are unhoused. The disempowering uh, ideologies are really two sides of the same coin. One is our society's penchant for blaming the undeserving homeless for individual failure, failures, whether it be laziness or some other immoral activity. And the other is uplifting the deserving homeowner as being successful, primarily due to hard work and virtue. And neither of these ideologies is free of racism. Americans commonly assume that most behavior is caused by the holding and practicing of values. In other words, we think that good behavior is a result of good values and bad behaviors from bad values, without recognizing the economic, political, and other structural conditions that people negotiate. While most staff at Christian shelters or home ownership programs believe that all people are deserving of hospitality and support since everyone is a child of God, these programs can often give preference to those who are willing to be changed based on the assumption that people are homeless or poor because they have bad values. Those who are not willing to change are viewed as undeserving and often criminalized for camping, sleeping, or simply congregating in public spaces. The focus and the blame the undeserving homeless ideology is on the deficits of the individual. As a former AGRM executive director, Stephen Berger claimed, the homeless person's quote, fundamental way of thinking unquote, must be challenged. He writes, quote, the homeless need an environment in which they are challenged to acknowledge and consistently renounce unhealthy behaviors. Otherwise, they won't acquire the practical or emotional skills they need to succeed, unquote. Here, homelessness becomes equated with deviance and so-called lower class values. The social myths that often permeate our collective consciousness are the following. People are homeless. People who are homeless are unreliable, incompetent, and or mentally unstable. Two, people are homeless because of a personal fault or characteristic, whether it be laziness, addiction, lack of education, disability. People are homeless because they choose to be homeless. And fourth, people are homeless. People who are homeless need discipline and structure to put order in their lives. Some of them believe that if unhoused individuals would turn their lives over to God or have better discipline, they would improve their ability to be housed. One affiliate executive director said about the men at the rescue mission, quote, once they get to a more mature level, they can be less bound by rules. Until then, the rules help, unquote. A staff member I spoke to was advocating for the book Bridges Out of Poverty that identifies the quote unquote hidden rules of belonging to the lower, middle, or upper class so that can prof professionals can help people in poverty adopt middle class virtues and behavior as a bridge out of poverty. This ideology is racially coded when we consider that over 60% of the homeless are African American or Latinx. A focus on people's deficit behavior without acknowledging the systemic and structural obstacles people in poverty face, especially racial minorities, 
serves to absolve societal accountability for unjust and racist policies and structures, both past and present. Historic policies empowered working and middle-class whites to own homes and thereby gain equity and wealth, while systematically prevented people of color from doing so. Uh, Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, if you haven't read it, outlines these policies in great depth. Racially segregated neighborhoods, a result of past and present policies, continue the separate and unequal status quo with extreme disparities in education and infrastructure funding, access to green space, healthy food and other amenities, and different levels of neighborhood safety, both in relation to environmental hazards and crime. Add to the mix the racial bias in our criminal justice system, especially our propensity to imprison a disproportionately large number of people of color, and it becomes clear that an approach focused solely on individual behavior as the cause of homelessness or precarious housing keeps racist and classist policies and structures in place. Now, of course, individual factors play a role, um, but I always share the musical chairs analogy with my students. It's stolen from someone else. Uh, in it, the players are poor households and the chairs are housing units people can't afford, or people can't afford. Remember, there's 36 affordable units available for every 100 extremely poor households. So there's actually too few chairs. Uh, and with those too few chairs, those who fail to nab a chair are those who are most vulnerable, whether by reason of individual choices or social and racial exclusion. The level of scarcity, too few chairs or housing, affordable housing units is a result of housing supply prices, subsidies, as well as incomes at the bottom of the distribution and social welfare spending. One problem with the blaming the homeless ideology is that it can affect the self-worth of those who are labeled. That is, they internalize the message, uh, an especially damaging reality for children who are actually the increasing face of homelessness. Another problem with labeling is that the solution to homelessness is then confined to transforming so-called deficit individuals rather than structures and policies that would support families and individuals to flourish. Equating homelessness with deviant behavior fails to acknowledge that homelessness is primarily a result of extreme poverty. It was no surprise to me when I was doing interviews for this book that every person on the street or in transitional housing that I interviewed grew up in poverty. And also many suffered um, some sort of abuse or trauma. Since organizations that build low income housing don't work with the unhoused directly, they probably don't consider themselves in the practice of negatively, negatively labeling people who are homeless. However, there's often indirect labeling that occurs. For example, placing home ownership on such a high pedestal as Habitat for Humanity does, can be disempowering for those who do not reach this expectation or who do but find its benefits elusive. While many studies have shown the benefits of home ownership, some of which are really important, financial equity, stability for children, pride of ownership, idealizing it furthers the deserving undeserving label. Home ownership becomes a symbol for all that's normal, good, and respectable, and historically, the ideal image of a normal and virtuous family was the heterosexual middle-class white nuclear family. This ideal, ideal image of family and homeowner was promoted and supported through policies and even espoused by presidents. Former President Herbert Hoover, an ardent supporter of the Better Homes in America, BHA program formed in 1922, said, quote, the owner occupied home is a more wholesome, healthful, and happy atmosphere in which to raise children, unquote. And according to former President Lyndon Johnson, quote, owning a home can increase responsibility and stake out a man's place in his community. The man who owns a home has something to be proud of and reason to protect and preserve it, unquote. The mission of the Better Homes in America program was to promote the, quote, unquote, right kind of American home with local chapters to encourage home ownership and maintenance, national contests for the best model home, and prolific amounts of literature outlining the ideal house with details on the room layout, furnishings, yard, and more. Despite its privileging of white middle-class version of home ownership, 
The BHA campaign assumed that home ownership was an attainable choice for all Americans and that lack of education was the only obstacle to buying a home, not segregationist housing policies, bank discrimination, or poverty. To be fair, Habitat for Humanity supports home ownership for many different family forms and racial groups today. Their cultural understandings have evolved over the years. Uh, I would say even since I wrote my book, when I had quoted former Habitat CEO Paul Leonard as defining home as, quote, a place of rest and renewal from our day's labor and a safe harbor for moms, dads, and children, unquote. Despite being more culturally inclusive today, Habitat's focus on the transformation of families from home ownership can imply that families were culturally lacking before becoming homeowners. Habitat's website and literature is full of testimonies from families about the transformative life changes that home ownership brought. As one homeowner said, quote, I didn't just receive a clean, healthy, and beautiful home. I received a new me, unquote. By equating home ownership with success and placing such a heavy emphasis on willingness to work towards success, Habitat buys into our society's judgment of people who appear to be dependent and are not making it on their own, and furthers the distinction between the deserving and undeserving poor. As one Habitat volunteer said, quote, I love Habitat's premise, the sweat equity, the fact that the family is able to work for this instead of just being given something. I can't imagine how they must feel, unquote. The truth is that the upper middle class and rich get most of our nation's federal housing aid, but rarely are they considered dependent or undeserving. The four largest housing related tax breaks for homeowners, the home mortgage interest deduction, which can be taken for up to two homes, the deduction for property taxes, the capital gains exclusion for home sales, and the exclusion of net imputed rental income are three times the total expenditures for all housing and urban or HUD development programs that might help the poor. Similarly, Habitat volunteers are considered empowered and spiritually whole by simply showing up to help on a build, whereas Habitat homeowners are only considered so if they show they've adopted the middle-class homeowner ethos of cleanliness, responsibility, and civic-mindedness and have proven their work ethic through sweat equity hours. They have to put in 500 hours, either helping build homes or working in a Habitat resale store uh, before they can have their home. On the surface, Habitat's idea of partnership is attractive, as all should partner together to create a better society. But without identifying power inequities or naming the normative ethos of middle-class overwhelmingly white volunteers, it isn't clear that all Habitat homeowners truly feel empowered as partners or whether they're simply following the rules for material gain, that is, getting a house. Emphasizing egalitarian ideals in situations where there's asymmetry of power can obscure and hide realities of structural oppression that exist in our society. Habitat's focus on changing the consciousness of the rich to give, but not on changing the structures and policies that create inequality and poverty fails to address the root causes of homelessness and precarious housing. I say all this, but I, I really do love Habitat as an organization. My grandfather used to work on the builds and his prized possession was a framed photo of a hammer that Jimmy Carter had used on one of the builds. So while the ideologies of undeserving homeless and deserving homeowner serve to justify oppressive realities and further practices of differential treatment, the root of homelessness and poverty is an economic system that's premised on survival of the fittest. Most Christian approaches to homelessness have little analysis of social structures or practices. Capitalist profit is achieved in part by keeping labor costs down and by maintaining a reserve on a, of unemployed and underemployed people seeking work. And housing markets are profit-driven in a capitalist economy. In addition, racism and sexism are structured into our economic and, and po political systems, serving to privilege some and oppress others. Yet in the end, these forms of oppression end up hurting everyone. I just finished a new book that I would highly recommend, uh, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs All of Us and How We Might Prosper Together by Heather McPhee, 
She argues that racism has actually prevented us from enacting policies that would benefit the majority. As white Americans have been socialized into a zero sum belief that any gains by people of color will come at white people's expense. The almost exclusive focus on transforming individuals and families like AGRM and Habitat have does not disrupt racist ideologies that keep substantial inequality of wealth and power in place. While Habitat's emphasis on the economics of Jesus, that is no profit and no interest charged for home loans, could be construed as a critique of our capitalist system, without sustained critical analysis of aspects of the system that cause homelessness, substandard housing and lack of affordable housing, Habitat home building is an alternative that fits quite nicely within the status quo. Furthermore, Habitat's encouragement of corporate partnerships without a power analysis of the conservative political influence of corporations can keep the organization from adopting a structural critique of capitalism. And its emphasis on changing the conscience of the rich puts the focus less on the power of structures and more on the caring, better off individuals who are willing to give back some of what they have, quote unquote, been blessed with. That being said, in 2019, Habitat launched a five-year campaign called the Cost of Home Campaign to advocate for policy solutions at the local, state, and federal levels so that more families can find quality, affordable housing in the United States. This is a step in the right direction uh, that I applaud since preventing homelessness requires a public policy approach. Nonprofit voluntary organizations should be part of the picture but their work does not replace governmental action and policies that address poverty and inequality. So I will stop there. I have a second section to the talk, but we had decided that we would let people ask questions, a couple questions before I continue. Okay, thank you, Laura. <clears throat> so one question uh, which came in um, before your talk actually, so it uh, asks you about the book you referred to, um, Bridges Out of Poverty and asks if you've heard about the work uh, of the Main Street Ministries in Houston, uh, which led a coalition there that reduced the homeless population from 135,000 to 25,000. So if you take that question. Well, I do have familiarity with the book, <laughs> actually, and, and, and checked it out after someone suggested it. Um, and I, I am a bit critical of its um, cha change the individual approach, uh, because the main premise of my uh, work is really that uh, the deficits of individuals, although those might cause some people to be homeless, the primary problem for homelessness is that we have um, a lack of affordable housing and we have work that does not pay a livable wage. Right now you can, you can't find, you can't afford a rent on any two bedroom place across the nation on a minimum wage job. And as we know, many people are getting part-time minimum wage jobs or even working in the informal labor market uh, with less than minimum wage. Um, I did look up, I got this question ahead of time. So I uh, did look up the uh, Houston program and it says, looks like the Main Street Ministries has some great programs, um, but there's still a uh, change the individual approach or a more of a charity approach than a structural approach. Again, I'm not saying those aren't good things. They have empowerment courses that are about giving people the skills, uh, which is important uh, on, on one hand. On the other hand, if you give people some skills, yet the jobs aren't paying enough for people to pay rent, um, or there aren't enough jobs because uh, a lot of jobs, uh, technology has taken over many jobs, um, the empowerment classes aren't going to do enough unless we think about how to structure work uh, so that, that, that it pays. I think they had some other programs in Operation ID, Resource Navigation, Community Garden, COVID Relief. Um, I think all of those are important uh, I, and they're, they're useful to people. Services are important. Um, but without uh, government support through HUD and other government programs, um, I think Houston has been able to lower their homelessness rate primarily because of their Housing First program, which is a program that gets people into rapid rehousing. Um, they've especially focused on veterans, uh, 
and they got help from HUD to do that. All right, that's probably all I have on that one. Okay. Um, one question that just came in, um, which maybe isn't directly what you're talking about, so you can uh, take it as far as you want to, but the question is about are some of these, um, you know, sort of homeless shelter rescue missions, are they uh, sometimes kind of uh, covers for people who are uh, really trying to convert people, I think is. Oh. Issue and you know, your perspective on that. Yeah, it's, it's, it was very interesting. I chose the rescue missions and Habitat for Humanity uh, because, well, first of all, Habitat because so many churches work with Habitat. Uh, but I also chose the rescue missions, be, um, both the organizations, because they were national organizations and they had affiliates across the country. Um, and at the time when I was doing my research, I was living in North Carolina. Um, so I started there. Uh, then I um, uh, interviewed some people and organizations in uh, um, Chicago. Uh, and then I spent a sabbatical in Washington State where I grew up and looked at organizations there. And I have to say that there was so much diversity among the different rescue missions. Uh, they tend to be a more um, evangelically focused uh, Christian uh, organization. Um, but I found, for example, in the South that it was much more about a mission, you know, trying to convert people, yet still helping. I, I wouldn't say all of it was about conversion. Uh, also having shelters, they were one of the few places that had free um, rehab programs. Uh, and then when I got out to Washington, they were really didn't focus quite as much on the um, evangelism part. But the rescue missions did uh, generally require that people go to a worship service when they stayed at the shelter. So that was a piece of it. Uh, I was not looking at that quite as much. I was more trying to look at how they understood the uh, problem of homelessness and how they addressed it. Um, and I think a lot of shelters have a similar way of looking at it, even if they're not religious. I think a lot of the uh, Remaining questions, both of those that came in before and those that are coming in right now, really anticipate the second half of your talk. Um, kind of getting at this, you know, why is it that in our society so much of the responsibility for caring for homelessness has fallen on, you know, faith based organizations and NGOs? Um, or is it possible to solve this problem in the country and so on? So I'll just uh, let you continue and then we can okay. tackle some more we'll of these bring questions. Bring those up when we uh, finish. Yeah. Okay, all right. So uh, the, the next section is called Hospitality is Justice, Creating a More Compassionate Society. So I've done a lot of talks with church members and at universities, and most of the time when I talk about homelessness, what they really wanna know is how they can make a difference and support a more compassionate and just society. The struggle, of course, is that advocacy and organizing with others for social change are long-term endeavors usually not individual short-term volunteer opportunities. That being said, I'd argue that the first step in the process of becoming a more compassionate and just society is to make the lives of people who are unhoused and precariously housed central to ethical analysis by understanding what obstacles prevent flourishing lives. How would Christian approaches that rescue the homeless or help them towards recovery or approaches that create affordable housing look differently if we quit seeing people who are unhoused and poor as having the problems. How would such approaches look if we saw the gospel as less about individual relationship with Jesus Christ and more about the physical, spiritual, and mental health of people within God's community? Assuming that the spiritual crisis is within specific individuals alone without addressing the ways in which our society is, spirit, our society is spiritually impoverished, simply blames those who are the victims of societal oppression and misses the many assets and gifts that all people have to contribute. So I call my approach a hospitality as justice approach. And in this approach, uh, I say it both dis disrupts policies and ideologies that create barriers for flourishing lives. And it also advocates for worldviews and policies that seek to include everyone in God's compassionate community. Christian communities must ask what it means to take seriously a call to be disciples of Jesus Christ in the world. Compassionate responses of hospitality and charity 
resistance to injustice and exploitation, and advocacy for systems and institutions that support justice and the well-being of all are equally important. The Way of Jesus suggests a bottom-up approach that moves upward from caring for each person in our communities. I, I teach a course on this today, and we were talking about um, how people are treated who are on the street. Uh, they're seen as invisible or they're treated, uh, actually, a lot of violence towards them. Um, so caring for each person in our communities is seeing them as having full human dignities, as people with personalities and, and wonderful things in their lives. Uh, so moving from that to then changing systems and structures to ensure a home for all in God's community. And I don't mean just uh, simply a me metaphorical spiritual home, but an actual home. Thus, hospitality must be connected to justice. Uh, I would argue that hospitality as justice was a foundation of morality in biblical times. Having been freed by God from slavery, the people of Israel understood that a covenant with God included caring for all within their midst by sharing their bread with the hungry and bringing the homeless poor into their houses. Isaiah 58, 7. Jesus also modeled hospitality as justice. At the Last Supper and throughout his ministry, Jesus opened the banquet for all to be seated at the table in relationship with God and one another. Jesus envisioned an abundant life for all, where humans are not only physically housed, but are truly at home within caring, inclusive, and sustainable communities. Paul sought to make such a vision of koinonia community a reality in the early church. Translations for koinonia include fellowship, contribution, sharing, and participation. The early church aimed to embody these values by caring for all its members, distributing goods according to need, and worshiping and praying together, Acts 2, 42 to 47. So the problem of homelessness is not only about individuals who find themselves without a place to sleep. It is a reflection of our collective identity as a people in a society. And I'll repeat that again. Uh, the problem of homelessness is a reflection of our collective identity as a people and a society. Our high value in the United States on individualism and each person being responsible for him or herself can hinder our ability to envision alternatives to what seems inevitable. Many of us assume that having people in the street and in poverty is just the way things are in our society and not something that can really change. Many Americans have been socialized to accept a dominant cultural worldview that promotes individual initiative, enterprise, and achieving the American dream. But a society founded on such a competitive worldview privileges the winners and marginalizes the losers. The people that don't grab the chair, that get the housing. The early church didn't assume there must be losers, nor did they believe homelessness to be inevitable. Jesus challenged those who tried to limit the seats at the banquet table and share crumbs rather than abundant loaves. Hospitality as charity doesn't afford recipients full human dignity in ways that enable them to participate fully in community and fellowship. The bountiful goods at the banquet table, they're not earned. They're gifts from God, and they're meant to be sustainably shared by all. And I would include non-human creatures as well. I also teach environmental ethics. They're not meant to be hoarded. All of God's creation is interdependent with each person an intricate part contributing to the whole. And love of neighbor entails both being a neighbor to others and allowing others to be neighbor to us. Now, I don't have any single blueprint for how we would flourish, have flourishing communities and uh, and homelessness, but there are some basic levels of human and environmental flourishing that we ought to aim for. For one, all people in a society ought to have decent housing. I would argue for a right to housing. They should have access to adequate health care and good education. And if they're able, work that allows them to live healthy lives and contribute to society. For people who are not able to contribute their work, we ought to find other ways that they can contribute and have services and safety nets so that they can live well. We have the means in this country to ensure that all people are housed. 
I would also say that basic goods are not all that's necessary for people to flourish. Meaningful avenues for participation for individuals and communities and the broader society is also important. And if we're to be able to participate in society and relate to one another as neighbors, then there needs to be a rearrangement of wealth and power. And we must address racial inequities and racial segregation. I agree, another book I recommend is Thomas Shapiro's book, Toxic Inequality. Uh, I agree with him that two principles should guide our change for American families. One is wealth building uh, for those families who not, have not achieved this, and the other is racial justice. The substantial inequality as well as racial injustice and segregation that we have in our society blocks solidarity between people, and it thwarts just and commun compassionate communities. This is apparent where I live, a maturity white and affluent county of the Bay Area, where there's substantial not in my backyard or nimbyism in resistance to the creation of more affordable rental housing. Community members are willing to fund a street chaplain for the homeless, but they resist higher density housing and increased public transportation to support multi-income and racially integrated neighborhoods. They often say it'll ruin the character of their community. Jesus' example of solidarity with the marginalized and exploited is important for pastors to emphasize in their ministry. But too often the topic of white supremacy and racism are dropped from both analysis and action in lieu of more vague calls to address poverty. We will not be able to end homelessness without explicitly transforming our policies and structures that keep white supremacy intact. Continuing to impoverish and imprison communities of color, and thwarting efforts to enact policies that would help all families and individuals. We all suffer when social solidarity is broken. Focusing on societal transformation is not easy for churches and religious organizations because it requires the difficult process of lifelong learning and long-term organizing in solidarity with marginalized communities. Churches and religious organizations can be, however, an educational partner for economic and racial justice. Study groups, sermons, workshops, immersion experiences, and more can help parishioners do the necessary race, class, and other forms of analysis to understand the structural causes of homelessness and precarious housing. To learn, for example, that in incarceration did not increase because of heightened crime, and that people didn't simply choose to live in segregated neighborhoods, but that intentional governmental policies created and sustain our current injustices. Learning from and listening to those whose voices are not often heard, those who are most negatively affected by oppression, is also crucially important for this continued learning. The good news is that no matter how complex and overwhelming the structural factors, because I know they are, policies and institutions can be changed. But this doesn't happen without long-term organizing and coalition building to make change happen. To have sufficient power to hold government and private corporations accountable requires working within communities and forming coalitions with other congregations and nonprofit organizations promoting social and racial justice. Practicing hospitality as justice to address homelessness requires basically a social movement to end poverty and racial inequality. Social movements are the result of groups working together to affect change in solidarity with the poor and marginalized who are unhoused or precariously housed. There are many examples of churches practicing hospitality as justice. I'll give a few um, from my area because that's what I'm familiar with. Um, so in the Bay Area, there's a group of African-American churches in Oakland um, that joined forces with the Dellums Institute for Social Justice to basically organize, organize against gentrification and the displacement of families of color in Berkeley and Oakland, uh, primarily due to the tech industry in Silicon Valley. They've spread over to Berkeley and Oakland. Uh, and they, they've done this specifically to address the racialization of the problem of homelessness. They directed $65 million of public funds toward an anti-displacement safety net that would help pay for legal protection for renters emergency rental assistance, and other services for residents at risk of displacement or homelessness. They secured anti-displacement terms in the city of Oakland's $100 million housing bond and removed housing barriers for formerly 
incarcerated residents. They also assisted the East Oakland Black Culture Zone Collaborative in developing a collective ownership model business plan for the Black Culture Zone Hub. All of these strategies aided in preventing homelessness. And although these policies helped low-income people of all races, their work was strategically focused on preventing eviction and homelessness for residents and communities of color. Pastors of the primarily white congregation of First Unitarian Church of Oakland are also taking seriously hospitality as justice. They introduced curriculum on white supremacy, structural racism, and white privilege to their parishioners, followed up by a church study on mass incarceration. At a social justice and empowerment weekend, they decided that education needed to lead to action. So in solidarity with marginalized communities, they partnered with the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights that organizes with black, brown, and low-income people to shift resources away from prisons and punishment and towards opportunities that make our communities safe, healthy, and strong. Together, they worked on a campaign to reduce the numbers of people incarcerated at the state level by shifting prisoners with low-level offenses to county jails, and they organized to ensure public funds for prison reentry efforts as a transformative way to prevent homelessness for African Americans and Latinx communities. There are multiple other ways that religious communities can advocate and organize for change that will work to prevent homelessness. The Industrial Areas Foundation, the nation's largest and longstanding network of local faith and community-based organizations, has local affiliates of ecumenical organizing committees. The one in my county has been working on increasing the amount of affordable housing. I looked up Ohio and in Dayton, Ohio, near you all, they have their own IAF organizing committee called Lift Greater Dayton. Uh, the website says they have 30 faith-based groups, including churches, synagogues, and mosques, organizing in solidarity with marginalized communities. I'm not sure if they're doing anything specifically with uh, housing and homelessness. Ecumenical organizations have been instrumental in getting living wage ordinance passed in their cities, while others have organized for universal accessibility to health care. Note that many of these um, advocacy efforts aren't primarily focused just on homelessness. They're focused on health care, living wages, uh, having more affordable housing, um, all of the incarceration, helping people with re-entry. Um, so addressing homelessness is really a multi-pronged approach. And then lastly, the Poor People's Campaign, uh, you can look that up, has gathered many religious groups together to challenge the moral narrative in our nation and organize for policy change. Just recently, they released the Poor People's Moral Budget, identifying where we should collect and spend funds to promote compassionate and just communities. All of these efforts, whether aimed at increasing wages or promoting access to housing and health care or challenging barriers for formerly incarcerated people, will aid in preventing homelessness, and they constitute a justice approach rather than a charity approach of helping people after they, after they find themselves unhoused. Solving homelessness in our nation won't be a simple fix of having more shelters, job training, or addiction programs, nor will occasional volunteering to help the unhoused suffice. I always hold out hope that we can work together to be part of a social movement to create a more compassionate and just society we all have access to God's banquet table, to adequate housing, food, health care, green space, safety, and more. Where we can live near one another and share in fellowship across race and class lines, as well as, well as bridge other ways we're divided. And where we are all meaning, able to meaningful, part, meaningfully participate and contribute in society. That's my optimistic, hopeful side. We should be prepared, however, that social movements for structural and racial justice will face resistance. Decades ago, the Brazilian Bishop Dom Helder Camara said, quote, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why they are poor, they call me a communist, unquote. According to Luke, uh, Jesus' first proclamation, oh, this is still part of his quote, sorry. According to Luke, Jesus' first proclamation of good news to the poor ended with an attempt by the faith community to throw him off a cliff, Luke 4, 16 to 20, unquote. Simply being good Samaritans to those who cross our path, however, is not justice work. 
As Martin Luther King once said, we must see that the, quote, whole Jericho Road must be transformed so that men and women will not be constantly beaten and robbed as they make their journey on life's highway, unquote. In other words, true compassion and hospitality goes beyond simple charity. In King's words again, quote, the edifice that produces beggars needs restructuring, unquote. While there's substantial work to be done, especially in our current climate of pandemic insecurity and political division, the community solidarity of a hospitality as justice approach that both disrupts injustice and oppression and advocates for social change can create its own hopeful momentum. And as one of my Christian ethics mentors, Beverly Harrison used to say, bless you and bless the revolution. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. That was both very challenging and inspiring, I think, for us to, uh, to want to take on these issues. <laughs> Perhaps the uh, um, one question that um, students especially maybe thinking of uh, is these, how, what can I as an individual do, right? Hopefully maybe some adults are more familiar with uh, either church communities or other kinds of community organizations, but still that kind of question of what can I do? Uh, so maybe you can speak to that. Um, I, this semester is the first time I'm teaching a course on the ethics of housing and homelessness. And um, the course has a service learning component where students have to do two hours of service in the community with a, either a, 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 well, it's been a little hard with the pandemics, but we have one virtual option, but with, usually it's with the kitchen or a place that distributes food, or we have uh, in my town, we have a place called, uh, organization called Downtown Streets Teams, where uh, the students work with a group of five unhoused people and they go out once a week and clean the streets and uh, create goodwill with the, the, um, the business owners as well. Um, so I'm saying all this because yes, the structural things is, are hard, they're long-term, they're not something one individual is gonna do. Um, but I think the first step is actually to learn more uh, and to, that's why the service learning is important because I can give them all these articles and, and ideas about theory but they actually need to um, hang out with people who are precariously housed or, or homeless to find out what, what people are saying, what, what are their stories. Uh, and when they get to know these people, they realize that the, these, they're people just like all of us, they're just in extreme poverty. Uh, and there's um, many different types of people who are homeless. There's families with children, there's, uh, you know, survivors of domestic violence, people dealing with PTSD as veterans, um, people who uh, lost a job. I, I mean, you could go on. And that's what my students are realizing is that there's, there's extreme poverty is really the issue. Um, and so start with it, start with a charity organization. That's fine. Um, uh, my church did a rotating shelter uh, because there was no shelter in our county. And we would cook dinner for uh, people who are on house and they stayed in the church uh, for one night a month. Um, and I just had conversations with them. So I got to learn what they dealt with. Um, so I, 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 I'm not against charity. Um, what, I'm, what I'm critical of is that we continue to build more and more charity options, but we don't actually address the, the structural pieces. So hopefully if you learn more about the issues and you get to know people that that prompts you to think further, how can I organize with others to change some structural things? And there's so many different areas. Uh, you know, there's been groups that did this living wage campaign. Uh, other groups might organize for affordable childcare, or I've worked with a group in my town um, that was really trying to combat the nimbyism around affordable housing. So we would attend the um, city hall meetings when people stood up and said, we don't want this in our town. And, and we even had formerly homeless people speak up at those meetings. We helped train them to speak up. So it wasn't just um, unhoused people speaking about these issues. Um, I don't know if that gives a good answer. It's always hard to say what we can do as individuals because to change structures and policies would, will take working with organizations and collaborating and organizing together. Thank you. No, I, but I think that is 
an important way to approach it. And I may even follow up with you about those service learning opportunities uh, for ideas for our students. Um, uh, something you just touched on, uh, a pair of questions about that, which uh, had to do with the mental health issue. Uh, so one question, Don Vandenberg uh, notes that, you know, a lot of the mental hospitals were closed and those people are kind of thrown onto the streets. And so there's this connection between um, mental health issues and um, and people who end up uh, homeless. Um, and how can this specific aspect be solved? He noted himself that he had worked, for example, as a police officer in Dayton in the 1970s and who was confronted with these issues directly. And he says he hasn't seen much improvement, you know, in past decades. There is not much improvement. At all. Yes, we, we closed the institutions. Actually, it started in the um, 50s, and many of them weren't good. So I'm that might not have been the solution, but we closed them, but then the idea was to have people with mental illness be served by community organizations, and we never set up enough community organizations for that. So again, it's about, that's why I love the, um, the, the Poor People's Campaign. It's about changing the narrative in our country um, that the homelessness is not an isolated incident. Uh, it's, collect, it's connected to our lack of a access to healthcare, for example. Um, it's not that someone who has a mental illness necessarily needs to be homeless. We have all sorts of people with mental illnesses who are housed, but you combine mental illness with poverty and lack of access to health care and resources for people, uh, and then they end up on the street. And I think a lot of people who end up being um, jailed, put in jail or even in prison, also have had mental illness because we've we've failed to um, support in a, in a in a substantial way health care for all so i don't have a magic bullet fix on that but it really is the we've got to start changing the narrative from this idea that we should have minimal government we shouldn't have any involvement um, private organizations are not going to address this if there's if it's there's no uh, end profit for them um, so we we've got to think about how do we care for people. There was a question uh, about something worth, you know, that's kind of on the books right now of like stimulus checks. Is this uh, something that, that can help the situation? And then more broadly, what do you think about the uh, universal basic income as a potential solution? Uh, I mean, the stimulus checks are a short term fix, right? Um, but I think they're very important if you don't want to. Right now, there's moratoriums on evictions, but that's not going to last forever. Uh, we've got to help people to, I mean, we're going to have bigger problems on our hands if we have all these people evicted and, and on the streets or in their cars or in campsites. Um, so we've got to have a short-term fix. Uh, and presumably, if you get more money in the hands of people who have no money, that will also boost the economy because they're going to be spending it. Um, not investing it, but spending it. <laughs> um, universal basic income. I, I need to do more research on that, but I I think there's some truth to it. I have been with my students looking at um, the, the Nordic models of social democracy and why um, they have a very low rate of homelessness. Um, and they have a generous safety net and pension system with well-funded um, public services. They collect tax money and provide education, health care, child care, and elder care. Um, if you're not going to do all that, then may, maybe a basic uh, income would be the other solution. Um, by the way, they also have uh, high paying work, a very progressive taxation system so that they don't have so much inequality in their societies. Um, all of these, and they're still capitalist societies, and we're not, they're not socialists, but they have policies that have some aspects of. Uh, what, what would usually be called social democracy. Um, so I would prefer to see that, where we actually um, provide things like um, education, child care, health care through tax money. Uh, and the reason I say that is I, I just feel that it if, if you're providing those things for all, it doesn't feel like a handout. Um, I think you could structure the basic income as not a handout, but my worry is that's what it would become. Uh, and whenever something is a 
considered a hand handout, then it's stigmatized, right? And then it's also ripe for cuts, especially um, in our society where we do have a lot of racism and we tend to stigmatize those who we think are getting handouts. Um, I don't know if that answered the question well enough, but. <laughs> okay. Well, I have a question from Alexis Franklin who says, my goal has been to structure my career as an economist around economic equality. Do you have suggestions on how best to help with this? You know, research, is it policy, think tanks? You know, where where's the best way to promote economic equality? Sorry? Is, that the is the question how best to promote economic equality? Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, policy. Of course, I mean, if he's an economist, he knows that. <laughs> I would start with the tax policy. I mean, we just had, uh, uh, you know, our tax policy change so that there was handouts for the rich and upper class. Um, and our tax policy has gone from being very progressive in the 50s, where we had a top rate of 90 percent and many different levels of taxation, um, where our top rate now is 36.9 percent or something like that. I'm not, I don't remember exactly. but. We can't change policies unless we um, convince people that that's what makes sense. Um, and that's why I, the, the book that I mentioned, The Sum of Us, What, what Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together, uh, I really encourage you to read it because um, every time we talk about policies like this, uh, we get told it's socialism and that it's going to give a handout to people of color. So racism gets used as a wedge, uh, and not all whites, but many whites uh, then end up voting against their own interests. Um, they get told that tax, if, well, I just saw a post somewhere that it was, that we're raising taxes on everybody, but people don't realize that you tax that actually redistributes wealth to create more equality. Um, you know, also just really, we're trying to get through right now a higher minimum wage. The minimum wage is so much lower than when it was first developed in terms of the cost of living. Uh, how do we, so it's, it's trying to help people to understand what is in their best interest because the majority of American families are struggling to get by. Um, right now, 90, I think the top 10% owns about 73% of the wealth in this country. We're at the highest rate of inequality than we've been since the 1920s. Um, so there's 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 tried and tested ways to address inequality, and I'm I know an economist would know all those ways, but it's trying to um, think about politically and the narrative, how we change the narrative to be about how can we all flourish. Um, I would argue that the Nordic countries do better because they didn't they weren't developed on racism and don't have as a, a big racial divide in their countries. Um, so racism gets used as a wedge between groups and pits them against each other instead of seeing that they actually uh, need to be in solidarity uh, and that there's many obvious policies that would help the average American family. Okay. There's a question about uh, whether rising uh, GDP helps to alleviate homelessness or whether there's kind of correlation between rising wealth and uh, tackling, I guess, homelessness specifically, but also poverty more generally. Rising wealth will not tackle inequality. <laughs> and uh, I mean, my take on a, and I'm not saying we can have a different system than capitalism, but my take is that it functions if you have a certain amount of people. I mean, you know, it's like what five to six percent unemployment is the best. And if that, if it goes under that, then they start doing policies to change that. Um, so yes, we want an economy that will create jobs, but uh, rising GDP doesn't tell us which jobs we're creating, whether they're sustainable jobs, whether they're positive jobs to help communities. Um, and it doesn't ensure that wealth is distributed at all. I mean, you only have to look at uh, the, the amount Jeff Bezos was making every hour compared to the average worker in Amazon to know that um, rising G D GDP does not that does not address the inequality. Um, and it also doesn't necessarily address the those on the bottom. Um, we could have great development. Uh, you can see this in many countries where there's they've they've grown, but they 
they haven't addressed the poverty. I don't know if that answered your question, but. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one, I think, will be the last question, um, just about the term justice. Uh, if you can say more about what it is, the, how you define justice or the oh way. My. That's opening up. A, I do a whole course on this. <laughs> um, I mean, justice can be defined many ways, right? Uh, you could define it based, I mean, there's six six kind of frameworks you can use based on uh, what's just could be what's legal, what's law. Uh, I would argue that's not a very good choice because it says that the uh, what's the, the law of minimum wage is what, $7 an hour in some places, 10 in others. Uh, I wouldn't call that justice. You could do it based on merit. Like if someone has qualities that makes, they should get paid more. Um, you could do it on equal treatment. So if everybody's treated equally, um, the problem with that is that if there's inequalities, that, that assumes everybody's at a level playing field. So if there's inequalities in society, I could use schools as an example. If you gave all schools equal funding, yet yet some schools have deteriorating infrastructure or in neighborhoods where there's lots of crime or poverty, have kids that have more needs, equal funding is going to be unequal outcomes. So my definition of, of justice really usually is created, created more with equity and um, need, uh, that we need to, um, there's going to need to be unequal uh, uh, investment. Um, so if we want to have equal outcome, we need to start investing in the neighborhoods that have been disenfranchised by policies over the years. Uh, we have to invest in basically communities, the neighborhoods where communities of colors are, um, because if we want a more equal outcome where everybody can flourish, um, to me, that's what justice would be. Uh, but there's many definitions of justice and not everybody's going to um, hold that definition. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stivers, for a very thoughtful and thought-provoking lecture. And hopefully this will inspire us to action and to go out and read your book. Um, I will say in conclusion, uh, once again, of course, to thank the uh, Puff family for uh, making this uh, lecture series possible. Um, and also, this is the second year running we have uh, tied the theme of the Puff Lecture with the uh, Social Innovation Weekend, which is coming up this weekend. Last year, we uh, looked at the issue of um, food insecurity, also very timely, pressing, um, concrete, important issues. Uh, and um, I think all of those of you who are registered will, in a follow-up email, will also receive notes about a, uh, a lecture that's happening on Friday uh, that's in connection with the uh, the kind of kick off the social innovation weekend, which is um, uh, sponsored by the uh, John Altman Institute for Entrepreneurship, doing some really exciting things over there. So once again, thank you so much, uh, Laura, for this really fabulous talk. And I'm happy to follow up with anybody if they have questions. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you.